So we are reading a treatise of affliction by the 17th century Puritan pastor Thomas Case. And this is some good stuff right here. You know, one of the hardest things that I've ever done as far as academic things are concerned is learning how to read Greek. Now, whenever I, whenever I got my first semester of Greek, I learned real quickly that I'm going to have some struggles right here because I was pastoring a church, just started a new pastoring a new church, have family, children, grandchildren, all these other things that got to do. And like I was having a hard time keeping up. Then I realized I'm going to get up at five o'clock every morning, dedicate 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., three hours, Monday through Friday, every week, just to study Greek. And that's what I did for that semester and for the next semester. So for a whole year of school, I guess you could say, I did that every morning, five days a week three hours studying Greek totally transformed my understanding of the scriptures. Now in reading the scriptures, I mean, it has taken me to a deeper level of the scriptures, teaching, preaching, understanding, comprehension, well worth the discipline I put into it. Thomas Case is trying to help us understand that also right here, a deeper meaning of affliction and deliverance. God brings us into a deeper understanding, our relationship with him, spiritual matters, eternity, all these things. Whenever we learn what we need to learn from affliction. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32 says, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Mm, that's good. Number three, deliverance from trouble alone isn't enough to prove or make someone happy. It's not said blessed is the one you discipline Lord and deliver from trouble, but blessed is the one you discipline and teach. Someone might be freed from affliction, but miss the blessing. Some bread may be cursed. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. A person might leave prison and their blessing behind. A fever might end while hell prepares for the sinner. Be thankful for deliverance, but don't be content with it alone. The best prayers in trouble aren't those answered by deliverance, but those answered by instruction. Jesus prayed with tears to be saved from death and was heard because of his reverence. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7. He wasn't saved from death, but glorified God's name. John chapter 12 verse 27, 28. He thanked God for counsel. I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Psalm 16, 7. The best prayer outcomes work for our good, not just our will, even devils get the request answered literally, but not God's son. After praying, leave the answer to God. That is an important principle for us to grasp. Think about that, that like Jesus wasn't saved from the cross, but he glorified God through that. So just the, the, the answer to prayer getting deliverance is not the end goal right there, but it is learning and growing from the discipline. Verse four, learn to judge your afflictions and deliverances. This serves as an examination. If you can say, God taught you through correction, you are blessed. Review the lessons presented earlier and compare them to your heart. If you can say, you learned inwardly, convincingly, experientially, powerfully, sweetly, and enduringly, you are blessed. Bless the Lord for his counsel. Psalm 16, 7 and say, I know, Lord, you, I know that your judgments are right and you have afflicted me in faithfulness. That's Psalms 119, 75. Did you realize the Bible talked about affliction so much? Hmm. Well, if you're saying no, then I'm right there with you, my friend. I didn't either. But if no one interprets affliction, if there's no divine message in correction, if the rod is silent, it is feared that the stroke isn't God's children. It's sad when affliction leaves people unchanged. It's worse when they sin more under distress, like King Ahaz in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 22. When affliction worsens pride, rebellion, and atheism, it signals a reprobate spirit near cursing. Consider this. You who forget God, Psalms 50, 22, verse 5. I mean, yeah, you know, Tom, Tom, um, Thomas Case is making a great point right here is that we're in danger. We're in, a, we're in a dangerous spot whenever sin is causing more rebellion in our heart, drawing, pushing us away from God rather than drawing us near to God. 
the world might be the world might call blessed those it considers miserable the world judges by appearances and might call someone suffering miserable but divine teaching in the spirit makes one blessed worldly judgments is based on appearances but godly judgment sees beyond the spiritual person judges all things but isn't judged by the world first corinthians chapter 2 verse 15. the world may see affliction as misery but the spiritual person knows the truth it's a small thing to be judged by man's judgment first corinthians chapter 4 verse 3. god will judge rightly we have the mind of christ first corinthians 2 16 to judge rightly number six if chastisements with instruction is a blessing admire god's wisdom power and goodness he can bring good from suffering like extracting gold from clay affliction can drive out sin making us better god's severe dealings are meant for our good the lord's disciplines the lord disciplines the one who loves he loves hebrews chapter 12 verse 6. god would rather fetch blood than lose his soul we are disciplined so that we cannot be condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians 11, 32. The discipline is sharp, but the end is sweet. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Man, that is good. The, the, the discipline is sharp, but the end is sweet. Love that. Number seven, suffering isn't as, as dreadful as it seems. Ignorance and unbelief slander God's ways. The psalmist triumphantly says, why should i fear in the days of evil psalm 49 5. when sin and suffering surround me he remains fearless divine teaching can turn the poison of affliction into a blessing your rod and your staff they comfort me psalm 23 4. god's children should consider the benefits of affliction the peaceable fruits of righteousness that keeps them from despair we do not lose heart, says Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Not looking at visible sufferings, but the invisible benefits. This helps endure tribulation with hope. Number eight. God keeps some under the rod for long. Sometimes the rod lies on the righteous for months or years. God's people often cry, how long, Psalm 6. Three. God keeps them long in correction because they've long sinned. Affliction teaches. When the lesson is learned, it ends. God doesn't afflict willingly, but to do us good in the end. When corrected, we should say, I will offend no more. Number nine. We are naturally unteachable. We don't learn until whipped by the rod. Multiple afflictions are needed for us to learn. We make God spend his rod on us. This should make us lament and justify God. Number 10, gracious hearts love the word for they improve their spiritual knowledge. They value suffering that teach them. Blessed is the one you discipline and teach. The psalmist says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Affliction is precious if it brings instruction. Carnal people die in ignorance, but gracious hearts learn even in prison. Grace and nature view affliction differently. So for in Christ Jesus, we should be seeing afflictions differently than those outside. Spiritually, this is it. Thomas Case is saying we've got to be able to frame this spiritually, eternally, put on our kingdom lenses and see that affliction is building something in us it's hard in the moment but that's the difference that's a separating point between the world and the flesh between lost and saved